Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning here in the gymnasium. There are handouts over by the bleachers and a special welcome to those listening on AM850 KFUO in the St. Louis area and worldwide on KFUO.org. Uh, we get to continue our summer series in the Gospel of Luke and it uh, is my last chance to, to teach uh, this summer at least. I will be uh, in a couple weeks uh, Dave Smith will be resuming his class in here and switching to 1 Corinthians, so just to keep that on your radar. But that's still a couple of weeks away um, before we make uh, that switch. So we get to stay in Luke for at least a couple more weeks, and we continue in Luke chapter 12. And one of the really interesting things about doing Luke this year in particular is because it is a series C in our lectionary cycle, a lot of the readings that we've had in this class have either come up right after, uh, occurred during, or in this case, um, we're covering just after they had come in the lectionary cycle. So if these readings sound familiar, if you're like, hey, didn't we just have that a, a few weeks ago? Yes, <laughs> yes we did. And so uh, we pick up with Luke 12, starting at verse 13, uh, the parable of the rich fool. And, and this is one of those situations where when you look at a pericope, and you, you, you know, sometimes we start at a verse and we can completely erase the context prior to the verse. You know, these things did not happen in a vacuum, and you'll see that how this is split with our lectionary cycle, while it's not bad, unless you are intentional about remembering what came before, specifically the second half of what we're going to cover today, um, it can be a little bit difficult to remember the context by which Jesus is saying these things. And so, Jesus has just uh, uh, had the disciples, or told to the disciples that they need uh, to acknowledge Christ before men, and then a man comes up to him. He's teaching in crowds. And this guy has a question or an issue. And I'm the oldest, so I can't necessarily sympathize with this. But likely he's a younger brother whose big brother is holding out some of the inheritance. He has an inheritance that he has a right to. And uh, big brother might be saying, well, you know, it's 60-40 or 70-30. Or remember when I, I paid for, for dad to go to this or that and keeping more than his share. So someone in the crowd, just a passerby, says to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now Jesus says something that is incredibly interesting, I think, because how often uh, are we reminded that God will come to judge? He says, Who has made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Man, why are you asking me these things? So the very first thing we want to be clear on is this is a purely civil sort of judgment that Jesus is referring to. <laughs> Jesus is not saying, you know, I'm not a judge in terms of the righteous sense between us and God, but rather between men, legal dispute like this, get a lawyer. <laughs> get a professional. There are people that you could go to to get this resolved. I'm telling you to focus on something bigger. And you're caught up with the things that are in this world. And so Jesus says to them, uh, says to this man, Take care and be on guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And then he tells them a parable. And this is one of those parables where he just stopped right at the end of it and didn't continue reading, which are, I will say, our lectionary cycle, this was July 31. So just a few weeks ago, we stopped right at the end of the parable. And then we say, this is the gospel of the Lord, except there's not much gospel in this parable. It's in the Gospel of Luke, of course, but in terms of law-gospel distinction, this is a parable that uh, it's all law. It's heavy-hitting law. Um, and it's law that uh, we struggle with certainly still today. So he tells them this parable. The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And... Uh, the kind of implication here is that that abundance means that it's not that he didn't have barns set up, and you'll see this as he um, continues, but that he, literally his goods overflowed. He outgrew, outyielded, had more abundance than he even expected or knew what to do with. And so he says, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, and be merry. This guy's got it made. All he has to do is build these barns, put his goods in it, 
sit back, relax, and it's five o'clock every single minute of this guy's life. <laughs> right? Uh, and it's always ironic when you think of the context of it that, you know, you see little Christmas towels, and we have them too in our house, so I'm not criticizing anyone. You know, it says, eat, drink, and be merry, and uh, that's the foolish person's outlook, and yet we sell them now for five ninety nine for little decorative towels around Christmas time. Um, so I don't know what that says about us. Uh, but God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? And that's the blunt reality of the law of this parable. He had everything set for his life. He would never need to work again. He could seriously sit, relax, enjoy the good life. And so what do you see as the law that Jesus points out immediately in this parable? Okay, he's making a God of his riches. What else might Jesus be pointing out? Just a blunt reality. He thinks he's going to live forever. He forgets the reality that at any moment, this God-given life can be over. You notice what God says to him. This night your soul is required. Who decided that? God. And so this man who was so focused on worldly things, on, on the riches of this world, on the abundance of those riches, where do those riches go? To somebody else. And Jesus says, so, this, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Now, if you have a piece of paper, if you want to, I don't know how many of you like to highlight or underline, but I would circle verse 21, because that is the point of the parable. It is not, don't have stuff. And sometimes it can be turned into that. It can be turned into very quickly, um, you know, this is kind of the monastic philosophy. And not that leading a simple life or um, even a life without many luxuries is, is a bad thing either. But the point of this parable is not that you can't have stuff. Why is the rich man foolish? Because he's not rich toward God. This rich man could have been both rich in the world and rich toward God. This man could have been rich toward God and poor in the world. But instead... He focused so much on the things of this world that he became rich in this world, in this parable, and poor towards God. Now, when you think about that in your life, where does this start to hit us? We're like the guy. Yes, bud. We're like the guy. Can we admit it? I mean, I'm not immune from this. There are days where it's like, wait a minute. How are we going to make this work? Turns out, infants are expensive. <laughs> right? And there can be days where you're worried about, well, is this set up? Is that set up? Is this going to go the right way? We can put it all together... And then it can all fall apart. My wife and I were reminded of this, and I've told this story before. When we first moved here to St. Louis for the seminary, we both left good jobs, uh, but we were not doing what we wanted to do. We were not doing what we thought God was calling us to do. And so we had got it all set up. We had stored up some money so that we could move out here. And we get here, and we had an apartment all lined up. Thought, okay, we got our ducks in a row. And we get to the apartment, and it is a total disaster. Like window seal falling out of the wall, like gaps in the wall sort of disaster. And my dad, who's a contractor, looked at us and said, you cannot live there. <laughs> uh, and all of a sudden, we were out this deposit. We were out. We didn't have jobs. I was a full-time student. She was still looking for something. I have a tuition bill now that I did not have. 
and you had this whole life that you thought you had set up, and you think, okay, I'm following God's will, I've got it all planned out, everything's in order, and you get there and it's a complete disaster. And I remember when my wife and I, we looked at each other and said, God, if this is where you want us to come, why would you let this happen? Right? Um, and the part of it that is uh, really cool is that because we didn't have a place to stay, we stayed with some people that my mom had taught with, and they were the ones who actually gave Whitney's name to Mrs. Profile at the time, which is the whole reason I'm standing here before you uh, today, some seven years later, right? And so God knew what he was doing, but in that moment, I admit, I was like that rich man. <laughs> I had it all stored up. Why would you take that away? little things that that can um, crop up with in our life. It's not just 401ks or interest rates or uh, IRAs. There are all sorts of things where we can sort of think we've got it all set, all put together, uh, and make that the idol. This could have been the fool who was obsessed with his health. <laughs> or, or the fool who was obsessed with making many friends. The point of Jesus' parable here, and in this case it is directed specifically to that brother who wants the money, right? But the point of what Jesus is about to say that comes next is that it doesn't matter what else is there. God is in control, and God will give you what you need. That brother who wanted his inheritance is not a bad guy. He's not wrong either. Very likely, he could have been wronged. He could be the one in the right. But before God, the wrong question to ask is, God, get me my share of the inheritance. My earthly inheritance. The right question is, God, how can I have my share of the inheritance, my heavenly inheritance? Um, and just a little bit after this in Luke 13, which is the gospel re reading for today, Jesus has the, a similar analogy with the narrow door. And I don't want to spoil it, that's what the sermon's on today. So if you were at eight, you already know that. Um, but the question before God is not, God, where are my earthly riches? But God, where is my heavenly treasure? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Yes, bud. Correct. And how good do we do at following that verse? Not good at all. And that's why this is an interesting text to read and not continue reading when we get to the lectionary uh, cycle. Because Jesus doesn't just end it there. And we're going to get to that, that back half um, of what he's saying. But when you end it just like that, you're left with a heavy dose of law. <laughs> that we're all guilty of. You know, and it kind of goes back to 1 Timothy 6.10. Uh, it's probably the verse on everyone's mind right now. If you think of money, what's probably one of the most famous verses that you think of? The love of money is the root of all evil. And I always point out there, it's not money. It's where your heart's at. It's the love of money. Here's the same concept. Where is your heart? Where, what are the desires of your heart specifically before God? You know, someone's desires of their heart were for Cardinals to win the World Series, and, and this man came up to Jesus and said, Jesus, can the Cardinals win the World Series? He'd have the same response. Okay. And then I also think of, because, well, this, if, you've, if you've heard me talk about it, you know one of my favorite books of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. I think of Solomon, who found himself in this similar position. And he himself was called by God to repentance to admit that he was the rich fool in Ecclesiastes. And the Old Testament reading for this day, for the 31st um, of July, just a few weeks ago, was from Ecclesiastes, uh, where one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible occurs, Ecclesiastes 1 verse 2, meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. <laughs> There's so much beauty in that, 
And it's so jarring all at the same time. And Solomon will even say, I tried women, I tried wine, I tried building things. I had more money than I knew what to do with. And he gets to the end of his life, and that's his conclusion. Um, and sometimes it's a needed reminder because it is so easy to get caught up and, and, and frustrated and focus on the, the very things that we um, see ourselves without. Or get so frustrated because our best laid plans do what? Yeah, they go by the wayside. They go by the wayside, and despite our best efforts, despite having everything set, it can be a complete disaster like that. And those moments force us to remember that God's in control. That's what I needed when I moved out to the seminary. I needed to remember I'm not the one controlling this process. <laughs> I'm not the one who uh, is in charge here. And so despite us trying to have everything set up responsibly and doing it how we thought we needed to do it, um, we learned very quickly God was going to direct us how he wanted to direct it. And I, I, uh, I pray I, I don't forget that. There are times where I remember it less than others. I'll just say it like that. <laughs> but I pray that's something that all of us can remember. Yeah, Joan. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah, so the, the comment was made how, you know, even if a relative passes, you may, you know, some of the first questions sometimes people ask are, you know, who gets what? <laughs> who gets what? Right? Um, and, uh, you know, it, again, if that's our focus, if, if that's why we're, you know, going through this life, and, and mementos aren't bad, getting an inheritance isn't bad, but again, it's where, where is that treasure that we've laid up? Is it in that stuff? Is it getting, you know, grandma's jewelry, or is it getting <laughs> our eternal life? Anything truly can become an idol. I mean, this, it's in some ways, I think, unfortunate that it's uh, labeled in your Bibles or in most Bibles as the parable of the rich fool. Because um, I would call it like the parable of the foolish heart. Because it's not just material wealth. Now, that's a big thing for a lot of people. But it can be anything. It can be even relationships. Uh, Solomon talks about uh, he once tried to uh, live as wisely as he could. And it drove him to madness. Wisdom became his idol. He lived wisely, and all he found was more vexation and anger. <laughs> you know, literally anything can apply to this. Um, and so Jesus then turns to his disciples. And this is the part where, uh, in some ways, it's completely understandable because the focus is so jarringly different. But I think it's, it's a little bit unfortunate that they don't, it's not all read together. It'd make it for a really long reading uh, on a Sunday morning, but that's okay. Because immediately after this, Jesus turns to his disciples and says to them, uh, Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. And this is exactly what you were getting at, bud. For life is more than food and the body more than clothing. What do you think Jesus is trying to get at with his disciples there? Why specifically might he turn to his disciples and say this? Yes. A tunic, yeah, an extra... He had sent them out. Yeah, go out. But then also, what were they going to face? And for this, again, we're going to turn back to what Jesus had just said before this man interrupts with this question about inheritance. So if you go to uh, Luke 12, verse 4, just before our section begins, uh, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body. And after that, nothing more they can do. But I will warn you whom to fear. Fear him whom, after he has killed, has the authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you to fear him. 
Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God. Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered, and you are more of more value than many sparrows. What is Jesus giving, uh, alluding to with his disciples here is going to happen. They're going to not only have opposition, but they're going to face those who threaten and with all but one uh, exception, succeed in taking their life, their earthly life. And so then we, we read these words again to the disciples. I tell you that your life is more than food and your body is more than clothing. What is he preparing them for? Persecution. Or the reality that uh, by earthly standards, following Jesus doesn't mean everything's going to go well. That was part of the uh, readings last week that that I preached on, both with Jeremiah and Luke later on in Luke 12 at the end of this chapter, saying to his disciples, you're going to face persecution. So consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? When you think back to that rich fool, what did he try to do? Set up his... Life. But could he control how long that life actually was? Who could? God. And could he look at his life and see beyond the 70, 80 years of his earthly existence? No. If you are then not able to do a thing as small as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Now, I want to point out here that that question gets posed, and you know it's kind of the obvious answer. And, and I will say, uh, I loved Chris Hill's sermon on this. If you haven't had a chance, if you weren't here two weeks ago, go listen to that. It's on our YouTube page. He did an excellent job. <laughs> but when you hear that question, what do you think? What's the expected response? Why are you anxious about the rest? What should the expected response be? Well, I guess we shouldn't be. (laughs) But what happens in our hearts? What happens in our minds? What happens in the world? We're easily distracted. Or how about this? There's a lot of things that can cause anxiety. Turn on the news. How much of it is good news? Turn on the news, read a newspaper, they're still around. Go on Facebook or Twitter, and how much of it is good news? Not much. And I, what I want to point this out is sometimes we can forget that, to admit that it can kind of be difficult to keep this perspective. The expected response, the easy response is, yes, I know, we shouldn't be anxious. But I actually think the more difficult response is to say, no, there are things that cause me anxiety, and yet I know when I take them before God, I need not be anxious. And it's more difficult because one, it admits our own failures. But two, it's also difficult because it doesn't go away. It rather gets cast onto God. If you're not able to do a thing as small as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies and how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive today and tomorrow thrown in the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? Again, who is Jesus speaking to here? His disciples. His disciples. Who are we? Disciples of Christ. Who is Jesus speaking to? Us. 
Not every day you get to come to a Bible study and hear, oh, you of little faith who are here in a Bible study. But this is the confession that we all have. I believe, yet help my unbelief. And this is where this parable of the rich man, I think, really starts, you start to see the dichotomy of the, kind of the, the two roads, right? The one who goes before the world and seeks to erase those problems, seeks to just make it comfortable, relaxing, eat, drink, and be merry. Versus the one who says, I might not eat, I might not drink, I might be miserable, and yet I'm going to go to God. And this becomes extremely difficult <laughs> because it's easy to sit in a Bible class and go, okay, I, I need to remember that. It's a lot more difficult when it's a Wednesday at 9.45 and things have gone completely haywire. <laughs> and things at work aren't going well, things at home, or even things with extended family. And then you have to remember, hey, <laughs> right, don't be anxious. Do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. So, going back to the parable of the rich man. What did he have at the start of that parable? What, did he, what was his unexpected, I guess you could call it, blessing? An abundance of crops. Who gave that to him? Easy, easy answer, God, right? What did he not seek? God. Why do I bring back, and I'm going to keep going back to this parable? Because God does desire to give us the things that we need. But it's not necessarily on our time, on our schedule, or by our plan. I mean, first of all, look where we live. Look at all the blessings that we have been given, and yet, look how much we complain. I mean, Americans are terrible at this, right? And I am no exception. I wish I was, but I'm not, <laughs> right? God knows what we need, and he gives them, gives those things to us. He doesn't say, You'll never have food. But rather, what does Jesus promise to give us? We say it every Sunday. Our daily bread. Yeah. Convenient, there's a bread shop called Daily Bread just down the street. You literally get your daily bread there. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, what do you think it means that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom? He wants you to be safe. He wants you, now I'm going to say something that's going to sound contradictory, to eat, drink, and be merry. But where does he want you to eat, drink, and be merry? In his kingdom. Yeah. And again, not to piggyback too much on... <laughs> this is what happens when we do a Bible study on the same topics that are coming up in the, in the lessons, right? But when you get to the wedding banquet, that's Jesus' whole point. He's trying to hammer this home. Is a wedding banquet a fun time? Sure hope so. <laughs> Should people eat, drink, and be merry at a wedding banquet? Yes! But where is that wedding banquet? In the kingdom. And you can see why this was so hard for the disciples to pick up as Jesus is going through this, right? You know, sometimes we harp on the disciples and, and you know, how could you not see what was happening? But when you really think about it, this, I mean, this is completely backwards to what the world says should be our focus. Jesus even admits the nations of the world focus on these things. Everyone does, across all time, across all eternity, from every nation on earth. And so you can see why the disciples would have such confusion. 
Look out in our world today. What does the world promote? Get more stuff. But it is the fo- fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Good pleasure that would occur when? On another day, that was good. A good Friday. And then you start to realize what Jesus is saying here. You guys are so worried about all this stuff, all the things that you need to get. You're so worried about keeping yourself well-fed, well-clothed. You need to remember what God is going to do. You need to hold tight to what God is going to do through me to give you that kingdom. You need to remember, you need to know, you need to keep with you how much he's going to sacrifice in order to bring that to you. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. Now again, If we cycle this out from the context of that parable of the rich man, what does this sound like? Don't have stuff. I remember I said at the start, that's not the point here. Now, I will say very, very clearly, it's a good idea to give to those who are in need. Um, It's a very good idea to maybe assess what do we have versus what do we need versus what can I do for my neighbor. But why do you think he says specifically here, sell your possessions, give to the needy, and provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old? He's not talking about your wallet. He's talking about storing up those treasures, laying up those treasure in heaven. Provide yourselves with a treasure in heaven that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. You know, it's interesting. Have you ever, um, I'll pick back kind on what you said, have a, have a relative pass away and so you're going through all their stuff, right? And you find something that maybe they've kept for a very, very, very long time. Something that was maybe really near and dear to them. Maybe something even from their grandmother or their, you know, their mother. Um, but it's been tucked away in an attic or in a basement in a trunk for a very long time. And you open it up, and what often is the case with an object like that? Yeah, it's, de- it's decaying. Maybe rusting out. <laughs> Maybe a moth has literally destroyed it, chewed through it. <laughs> and you think about all the, the different... Uh, things that you, you see happen in the news with, with thieves and both financial crimes and more personal crimes. You know, there's cars stolen in St. Louis here every day, right? With the best lock systems in the world, you can still lose your stuff. With the tightest trunks, the moth can still destroy. And so what is Jesus pointing his disciples to, pointing this man to, pointing us to almost painstakingly, repetitively. Where does your heart lay up its treasure? Now, you read this, and you don't remember the parable of the rich man, and you can think, okay, this is, I would say maybe a little less poignant, maybe a little bit more open-ended. But when you consider the brother who demands his inheritance, What now do you see Jesus doing with his disciples, with that man, with those he's speaking to? Watch out. Because whatever you think you've got figured out, if it's not centered, not rooted, not founded with your treasures being in heaven, it will be destroyed. Uh, One of my favorite hymns is that is built on the rock, the church will stand 
even as steeples are falling. That includes that building there. <laughs> that includes this building here. And hopefully that's because in a couple of years we'll be knocking it down to build something <laughs> part of phase two. But even if, let's say, we never did that, just let it sit here, it would decay. So I will open it up to any questions. Um, I didn't really give you any time for questions after the first little pericope. So are there any questions kind of on both sections here? Thoughts, comments? Yes, Rob. Yeah. Yep. Well, you're, you're exactly right. You see the, uh, Jesus' own example, right? Um, it, he did not count equality of God something to be held over people, but rather in humility came and endured suffering and shame and even death on a cross. And so, yes, Jesus is an embodiment of these, uh, this kind of idea, and it's good that he is. <laughs> this is an embodiment of a lot of really good ideas. All right, any other thoughts before we move on to being alert? All right. So verse 35 then, continuing Luke 12. Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table, and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. So what is interesting, again, in the context of Luke 12, and this is where you have to start looking at that big picture. So what is Jesus saying now to his disciples? Well, get ready. And not just to those 12, but to those who are listening to it as well. What happens when a master of the house comes home in the second and the third watch, which, by the way, would be you know, early morning hours, way, um, way past anyone's bedtime, right? Uh, though my, my daughter might be awake at those hours, I guess. Uh, so that for, I probably am awake at those hours. But if he comes and finds servants that are awake, they're blessed. Why would he bless them? Well, the thief doesn't get to do what? Has a, have his way with them. And so what does the master offer them? A place at the table. Hey, we start getting the banquet analogies again. You can see why, um, ideally, it's a good idea to read a lot of the surrounding stuff. Because then when you hear something like Luke 13, and you hear this wedding banquet, and this narrow door, you see that that's a continuation of even what we're talking about now. But know this. If he known when the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You are ready. Be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And so Peter says to him, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? <laughs> and the Lord said, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household, to give them their portion of food at the proper time? So does Jesus answer Peter's question? Yes and no, right? So is this parable, this whole parable, all of this that you have been saying, is that for us or for all? For both, okay, well, yeah. Specifically on this context, what is Jesus entrusting them with? The, the disciples themselves. 
What will he entrust them with? The Great Commission. Yeah, he, they are the apostolic witnesses. So in that sense, the answer is yes, this is for you guys. You, Peter. <laughs> you, John and James. But we who sit here today, what do we have? The same thing that he gave to them. His message, the apostolic witness of who he is and what he came to do. Who then is the faithful and wise manager whom his master will set over his household? Now I will say, this is actually one of the more humbling verses to read when you think about it uh, as a pastor. Because <laughs> there's a responsibility there. There's a big responsibility. But how about for you each and every day of your own life? Whom has God placed you over to care for? Family, friends, co-workers. And so in that sense, is this for just Peter and James and John to understand and take with them? No, who is the wise and faithful manager? Well, Jesus is saying, I hope it's you. <laughs> and what will they receive at the proper time? Verse 40, was it verse 42? What will they receive at the proper time? Food. And we're back to the beginning. And you can see how helpful it is to kind of read these things um, as a whole. And not that it's a segment, it's, it's, but that's one of the great things of a class like this, is that you get the whole picture, the, the wide screen view. Uh, so that proper time, who sets that? The master, God. What does Jesus instruct his disciples 20 verses earlier, roughly? Don't be anxious about what you will eat or what you'll drink. <laughs> Don't be anxious at <laughs> where you're gonna live. Don't be anxious at what God's going to do, but rather, Allow him to do it at the proper time. Allow him to give you your daily bread. <laughs> Blessed is the servant whom his master will find doing so when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. <laughs> this is the gospel of the Lord. <laughs> Thanks be to God. Who was that in reference to? Again, this is where you have to go way back to the beginning. This is back to that parable. This rich man who literally did whatever he had to do to get rich. And, but at the end of the day, if one is not rich with God, what happens when the master returns? Cut him into pieces, yeah. Woof, woof. That's, yeah. Starts sounding like an Old Testament minor prophet or something with that sort of language. Um, Cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew his master's will, but did not get ready or act according to his will, will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. Everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand more. You didn't know Jesus quoted Spider-Man, did you? Oh, that's right, yeah. Now, this course is borrowed by Spider-Man when uh, he first gets bit by a spider. Uh, but everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. So how does this then, again, 
apply back to the whole situation that Jesus is looking at here with his disciples. This guy who wants his inheritance, the parable of the rich fool, the instruction to have no fear over him who can end life but not cast into hell. What is Jesus prepping those disciples for? Yes. And they will be rewarded dearly as well. The comment was made, made they've been given a big responsibility and they will pay dearly for that. Uh, pay dearly on earth, though. But they so too have been given a big reward, a treasure. And this is where I think this, um, this whole section of, of chapter 12, and even as, if we go past um, where I have printed out on the readings, what we had is the gospel reading last week where Jesus says, sons and fathers will be divided because of me. I'm not going to bring peace, but I bring division. <laughs> Jesus is prepping his disciples for the responsibility that he is going to send them out with. He's prepping them to be scared out of their mind, not know where to turn, not see where their next meal is coming from, not know if they're going to make it through the night, and yet put all their faith and their trust in him. And then you think of where we're at. Good news is we've been given responsibility. Yes, James. Uh, so the question was posed are we not aspiring enough if we just get the light beating Uh, let's not be that servant let's be the one the first one who gets to recline at the table yeah yeah so the servant who is delayed and or thinks the master is delayed don't the, the goal is to not be that servant if i'm not clear here Jesus saying don't be that guy Don't be the guy in the parable. (laughs) Hopefully that's not been lost on anyone. Right? Um, Yes, Ruth. Oh, this is a great point. And actually, Bud, could you check, is it Megos in the Greek? You have the Nestle all in there? Um... Verse 48. I think it's Megos, if I remember correctly when I was looking at it. Um, But it's a a yes and a yes. Yes, that to whom God has given many material blessings, (laughs) you have much responsibility with those blessings. Uh, Not to store up for yourself. You know, think about this this gentleman, who, uh, this rich fool in the parable. Where could he have put those goods? He clearly had storehouses. He already had an empire. He got so much that he couldn't fit it. What's, what's something he could have done with it? Oh, give it away. Yeah. And then the second uh, point was made is, or is this talking about who has been given much in spiritual blessings? And once again, yes. Right? Um, now, I think we have all, in one sense, been given greatly in both. And Jesus' point here is, this responsibility is one to take seriously, to get ready for, and don't ask the question that this guy from the crowd wants to know. Can you fix my earthly things? Let God handle the earthly things, and you focus on how can I serve you and serve my neighbor? And not get a light or severe beating, as uh, someone pointed out. Uh, And so then, the verses that were for our gospel lesson last week, the, I have not come to bring peace, but division, it applies to the same concept. Does Jesus come to bring peace? Does Jesus come to bring treasures? Does Jesus come to allow us to eat, drink, and be merry? Yes. But where? Between us and whom? God. All of these things highlight the same illustration, that, the same point that Jesus is trying to make, the same point that we so desperately fail to remember each and every uh, day at times, right? 
We get so caught up in the, the earthly things, the worldly things, that we can forget what he came to bring to us, where that true treasure is. Jesus came to bring peace, but between us and God. So that means if son or father or aunt or uncle or mother or daughter-in-law, as he would say, hates you for it, that's not where your treasure is. You can still love them. You can still enjoy them. You can still love the things and the, the blessings that God has given you materially. But that is not where your treasure is. And this is why I'm going to go last time, all the way back to the start of chapter 12. What is the first way Jesus illustrates this? It goes beyond just stuff, but even includes our very life. You go again back to Luke 12, verse 4. <laughs> Do not fear those who kill the body, and after that have nothing more they can do. That even to the point of someone saying, I'm going to kill your body, you are to say, well, that's not where my treasure is stored. And so this is an incredibly rich chapter of Luke. Um, it's why we have so many weeks back to back to back to back in the lectionary reading where we go through it. But it lets you look at the whole chapter and the whole context of what Jesus is trying to give to his disciples. Um, sometimes we can get too narrowly focused on, all right, is it about money? Whoops. They're going to love that on the radio. Is it about money? Is it about family welfare? Is it about being good stewards of what we've been given? Um, is it about our life? Well, it's all of that, yes. But it's any possible aspect of who we are that gets treasured up before God. Ahead of God, I should say. We are to remember that we should be willing to cast it all aside. <laughs> For what treasure? A heavenly treasure. Yeah. So, uh, we're just, we have five minutes left, so if we have a couple questions, bud. So back in the Yes. But then later on, when he talks about the yes. Son of Man who comes to take away the goods of the owner of the house, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's the it's the. Um, so if the master of the house knows when the thief was coming, he would not have left the house to be yeah, broken into. Yeah, and that you do not know the hour that the son of man. So yeah, that's a good point. That it's kind of an odd contrast that the initial part of the parable is the 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 master serving the servants, which of course is a great. Um, uh, image to think about, and where do we see that happening in Jesus' life? I mean, literally. The Last Supper, right? What, washing their feet. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yep. No, you're, you're absolutely right. That's the unexpectedness. And it's, it's interesting because I, I'll share... As a pastor, you get all sorts of weird spam emails about, you know, kind of weird stuff that's, like, biblical. And, and this is a good example of it. Just on Friday, I got an email at, like, 3 in the morning from this company letting me know that they have figured out when Jesus is returning. <laughs> if I give them $100 and start a ministry partnership... They'll fill us in. So, um, but I, I thought of it, it was kind of funny. I was thinking about this in my head. Yeah, the unexpected nature of it. It's like every time you see that, that's a good idea to say, uh, run. <laughs> if someone says to you, I know when. Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's exactly right. And that's where, I mean, truly it will be 
completely unexpected. When you, um, you know, it's not going to, there's not going to be a bunch of countdowns. You're not going to have a 10 days left, um, which is why each and every day we should be diligent, be prepared uh, to serve and to execute this great responsibility that we've been given and to make sure our treasures are in the right place. Right? Oh. Yes, that's exactly right, Steve. All right. With that, uh, any last questions before I close this in prayer? All right, let's uh, pray. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, I pray that you would allow us to store our treasures in heaven, that your Son and your Holy Spirit would work in our lives so that we need not uh, be anxious or worry, whether it's with family, whether it's with our very lives itself, whether it's with money, whether it's with any of the, the things of this earth. We know, Lord, that at the proper time, you have provided and will give to us uh, a life, uh, a feast, a banquet that we could never, ever deserve of our own. I pray that you would keep, allow us to keep this in our mind, that we'd walk humbly in your spirit, and then in all things we give glory to your holy name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen.